Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Myocarditis Foundation Zoom call family meeting. We'd like to thank you all for taking time from your Saturday to be here with us today. What is this? Technical difficulties. <laughs> I'd like to introduce and tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Genevieve Vermori. I've been the executive director for the Myocarditis Foundation for the past seven years. I'm a registered nurse with more than 46 years of experience. Gosh, that's a long time. Many of those years were in cardiac and emergency room nurses and I have nursing and I have personal experience in dealing with myocarditis and the side effects that it can cause up to and including heart transplantation. Today is our first virtual family meeting for 2022. And we have an ever increasing number of participants from various countries around the world. This is one positive outcome of the COVID-19 virus, the awareness and popularity of virtual meetings, allowing us to get together with people around the world to discuss myocarditis and pericarditis, two rare diseases that often go hand in hand, as well as COVID myocarditis and the COVID vaccines. Hopefully we will be able to get back to our in-person family meetings sometime soon. We are planning for one in late September at National Harbor, Maryland. Please look for upcoming information on our website and in our social media pages. Now today we have participants from six countries joining us. We hope that you are comfortable and have your morning or afternoon beverage of choice with you depending on what area of the world you are in as you listen to our esteemed cardiologists and researchers respond to the questions that you have sent in. Please remember that this cannot be a personal consultation of sorts. The doctors will try their best to give you as much information as they can based on the questions that you have sent in without getting specific to each of your cases. We are trying a new format for our meeting this time with our panel. We have asked our doctors to give a talk in their areas of specialty, adult or pediatric, based on and including the questions that you have sent in. So they will be just discussing the questions that you have sent in as they discuss the uh, various topics. We ask that you please wait for the last 30 minutes or so of the meeting before asking any additional questions that you may have on the chat screen. Your question may have already been answered throughout the discussions. We will attempt to answer as many of your questions as we can. I would like to take this time to introduce our esteemed panel of cardiologists and researchers. Two are from our current board of directors and one is from our founding board of directors for the foundation. They are all well-versed in caring for patients with myocarditis. Dr. Jack Price is a pediatric cardiologist at Texas Children's Hospital. Dr. Price specializes in myocarditis, heart failure, and transplant cardiology in children. He is a professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine and has been a member of the Myocarditis Foundation Board of Directors since 2014. Dr. Price is currently our director of pediatrics for the Myocarditis Foundation at Texas Children's, he initiated and was the director of the first ever pediatric specific heart failure intensive care unit where he has treated many cases of myocarditis. Dr. Bettina Heidecker is an adult cardiologist and head of the heart failure and cardiomyopathies at the prestigious Charité University of Medicine in Berlin, Germany. Dr. Heidecker is also a fellow of the European Society of Cardiology and was one of our first Myocarditis Foundation Fellowship grant recipients. She has been a member of our International Medical Advisory Board for four years before transitioning to our Board of Directors and is currently Director of Research for the Foundation. Dr. Mario Dang is an adult cardiologist and professor of medicine in advanced heart failure, mechanical support, heart transplant at the David Geffen School of Medicine, UCLA, Ronald Reagan uh -oh. UCLA Medical Center. Dr. Dang was a founding board member for the Myocarditis Foundation. He is the co-inventor of the first diagnostic leukocyte gene expression profiling biomarker test. That's a big mouthful, but basically a blood test to, it's called Alamap, and it has gained FDA clearance and international guideline acceptance to rule out heart transplant rejection without invasive endomyocardial biopsies. This has saved many transplant recipients from high risk, invasive and expensive repeat biopsies, which are needed to look for early rejection in their transplanted hearts. 
Thank you again in advance, doctors, for sharing your expertise, excuse me, expertise and knowledge of these diseases with us today. Now, we usually start with the adult myocarditis questions, but today I'd like to give the floor first to our pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Jack Price. The COVID and vaccine questions will be answered as a group panel a little later in our call. Please keep in mind that just because Dr. Price will be speaking about pediatric myocarditis, there will be things that relate to adults as well. So stay with us, please, even if you did not ask a pediatric question. Now, Dr. Price, we have a number of pediatric parents on the call who have sent in questions about the following things. I know that you have been given these questions prior to today and I will share them with everyone so that you all will know what he will be speaking about. The questions are how difficult is it to diagnose myocarditis? What signs or symptoms should parents be looking for to differentiate between myocarditis and say the common cold and the potential need for cardiac assessment? Is one more at risk of developing myocarditis again from a different virus? Are there specific guidelines for getting an MRI ordered, such as the timing, when it should be ordered, et cetera? And what does it mean if you have continued complaints of chest pain and dizziness after you have been cleared to return to exercise? And finally, a very sad question from a bereaved parent. If you are not diagnosed with myocarditis and your child dies in their sleep, what are the chances that if you were diagnosed correctly and taken to the hospital that you would have survived? Survived. I give you now Dr. Price. Well, thanks very much, Jen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, welcome everyone. I'm glad we're able to meet at least virtually. And I hope that um, many of you might be able to join us later in the fall when we meet um, for our annual meeting um, in Washington, DC. Uh, I think it's in September or, or October. Don't remember the exact dates, but um, it'd be a great time to get together again in person uh, and discuss things further. Um, I'd like to just give sort of a broad overview of myocarditis in children, um, obviously including you know, some of these questions that have been posed um, and expanding a little bit more beyond that. And then later we can ask, uh, answer any additional questions that anyone might have. But I thought I'd just start with sort of a, a basic question related to myocarditis. You know, myocarditis means inflammation of the heart muscle. And um, so sometimes it's confusing what exactly that means. You know, what is inflammation and how could it impact on the heart muscle? Um, in very simplistic terms, sort of the fundamentals of inflammation are, you know, swelling and redness and pain and, and warmth or heat. And you usually see those in things like um, a a bug bite, you know, or, or some kind of injury uh, like that. And the same sort of uh, basic um, uh, conditions or, or cascade of events can also happen in the heart when the heart has been injured. Now in kids, uh, almost all cases of myocarditis are caused by a type of virus, uh, various different types of viruses. Um, and so the virus itself, yes, can cause injury, say, for example, like a, a bug bite, the bug can cause injury. But much of that injury um, that we see in myocarditis comes later um, as the body responds to that initial injury. Um, and so, for example, a virus um, attacks the heart muscle, maybe disrupts um, some cells, breaks some cells up, um, and that exposure and disruption can then trigger the body's own immune system uh, to go into overdrive and, and to um, localize to that area of injury and begin a cascade of events that cause what we call inflammation. And so different types of white blood cells, for example, may migrate to that area. Uh, different types of chemicals and enzymes can be released, causing further injury, swelling of the tissue. Um, patients may uh, end up with uh, injuries such as scar, which can provoke abnormal heart rhythms. Um, and in some situations, uh, sometimes depending on the type of virus, uh, our own immune system can begin to attack um, certain uh, components of heart muscle, um, mistaking them uh, for the virus itself. Um, and so this can go on for several days before it begins to um, uh, quiet down and begin to resolve and the patient can convalesce. 
Now I mentioned that most cases in kids are caused by viruses. Um, those viruses are most typically viruses called enteroviruses, um, adenovirus is a, is a type of virus, parvovirus, but it's not just viruses. It can also be bacteria. So for example, uh, strep or staph, you know, basic uh, types of uh, bacterial organisms. Um, non-viral, non-bacterial uh, organisms also have been implicated. And sometimes even um, uh, uh, exposures, you know, for example, toxins, antibiotics, other types of exposures can also cause inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, and in some situations, different diseases can cause inflammation. So for example, lupus uh, and other types of autoimmune diseases can cause um, inflammation of the heart muscle. The prevalence of pediatric myocarditis is still um, up for debate. Um, and it's because it's so difficult to diagnose. Um, but there have been estimates you know, generally around 0.1% um, of all pediatric hospitalizations um, occur as a result of myocarditis. The age distribution is fairly broad, but we do see two spikes um, in, pediat in the pediatric age group. One is in uh, newborns and infants, and then another spike is around um, puberty, uh, around 15, 14 years of age. Um, we see those two spikes. About um, half of the cases of myocarditis occur after age 14 or 15. Um, it's been hypothesized that that may be related to um, sex hormones like testosterone, especially since there's um, the majority of cases uh, in that age group occur in boys rather than girls. And that's been a subject of research uh, that's ongoing now. What are some of the signs and symptoms of myocarditis in kids? Well, it can be challenging, especially if it's the younger kids, the infants um, who can't really voice their complaints. But in older kids, they may complain of upset stomach, abdominal pain, chest pain. They may describe palpitations or skipped or irregular heartbeats, um, syncope, which means fainting spells, uh, shortness of breath, fatigue. And, and in some cases, the first presenting sign may be sudden death. Um, and in a study uh, from Europe um, a few years ago, they evaluated um, autopsies of children who had died and found that of those who had died suddenly, 13% of that pediatric age group, their deaths were attributed to myocarditis. But it's difficult to diagnose. Um, you know, the symptoms I've just described to you are pretty common symptoms um, in pediatric emergency rooms and pediatric doctor's offices. And so the symptoms and the signs of myocarditis actually mimic common childhood illnesses. And so it just makes it a, a challenge for caregivers to sort of dissect out um, what is the source of those symptoms. And we recently did a study here in uh, Houston and found that about 50% of new cases of heart failure in children had been misdiagnosed. They had, they had been seen by a physician or some type of caregiver prior to the uh, final diagnosis and been misdiagnosed with something else, sometimes being treated for some other disease process that they didn't have or being uh, undergoing invasive testing that, uh, turned out to not be necessary. So it can be a challenge to sort this out. Um, but if we have symptoms that are not following a simple, typical sort of cold course, you know, most colds, you know, they're, they're over, they're, the symptoms are improving within 48 hours. But if symptoms are persistent, or certainly if they're worsening, um, I think it's definitely um, worth um, reaching out to your pediatrician um, in some situations, we may do additional testing if our suspicions are high enough for myocarditis. For example, blood work, um, a couple of common blood tests that we perform are something called a troponin test, which is um, uh, a protein that's released from the heart in situations of injury. And then another test called BNP, B-type natriuretic peptide. This test is performed or is this uh, laboratory value is elevated in situations of increased volume or pressure load on the heart, which you might be able to see in uh, new heart failure from myocarditis. Um, something as simple as an EKG or a chest x-ray can also be helpful 
in sorting through the diagnosis. If our suspicions are high and uh, all signs are pointing to myocarditis, um, we may consider a cardiac catheterization to obtain a biopsy of tissue to help us in uh, making the diagnosis. But more often today, what we're doing is performing a, a cardiac MRI. And we're learning a lot about MRI, at least in kids who have myocarditis and finding that it can be um, very reliable and highly accurate. And um, uh, we're now performing those fairly routinely um, at the time of admission, or at least at some point before um, hospital discharge. Now, sometimes myocarditis, unfortunately, is made, uh, the diagnosis is made on autopsy. And autopsy findings, um, you may see um, cellular infiltrate as what I described before in the heart muscle itself. Sometimes it can be patchy um, involving just one of the two ventricles, more often the left than the right. And, um, uh, and it can just show the challenges of even doing something like a, like a biopsy where you might miss the diagnosis if you're not biopsying in the right area of the heart that's affected. Well, how do we treat myocarditis in kids? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a definitive um, therapy to um, treat myocarditis. Um, in some situations, we have antiviral therapies that we can use, but for the most part, we don't. Uh, and instead, what we have to do is provide supportive care, which means um, providing symptomatic relief if they're, if they're having symptoms, um, you know, oxygen if they're short of breath, for example, pain relievers if they're experiencing pain. Um, uh, in some situations, we might uh, treat with uh, medications like steroids or um, immunoglobulin, um, although the data still are not strong that um, these therapies are effective. Um, but I think if you're in a situation where a patient is severely ill uh, and their condition is deteriorating, that it's worth using these therapies. And then the patients who are the sickest, so for example, those patients who present to us in shock, for example, low blood pressure, their heart function is very abnormal or low, we could even consider advanced therapies like artificial heart pumps um, to support the circulation and get them through this um, critical period. Because the good thing about myocarditis is that in most cases, it is salvageable. We can reverse it, the patient can improve, and uh, in many cases, um, uh, have their heart function restored to um, normal capacity and efficiency. Um, so uh, whenever I see a case of new onset heart failure and the patient's quite ill, I'm actually somewhat relieved that the patient has myocarditis rather than a genetic form of, of heart disease. Well, what are the outcomes? Um, as I mentioned, the majority of kids who are affected or impacted by myocarditis will go on to have uh, improvement of their heart function and for many, nor complete normalization um, within the first one to three years. Uh, at three years, it's estimated that somewhere around 15 to 20% may need cardiac transplant. And by three years, about 5% have not survived. Um, beyond three years, um, the outcomes really don't change at all. And so that's really what we see are the changes in those first three years. Um, I'm going to um, not say a lot about COVID right now. I, I will just mention something that's unique about COVID in children. Um, obviously COVID can impact on the heart in various different ways. And I think we'll get to that later on in today's um, meeting. But I wanted to highlight one area of COVID that is fairly unique to children. And that's that um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome that occurs in children. And this is a, uh, uh, an inflammatory event that occurs usually about two to four weeks after a patient has been infected with the coronavirus. And <clears throat> this um, can present with symptoms of um, lymph node enlargement, um, uh, inflamed eyes, conjunctivitis, uh, swelling in the face, a rash on the face, sometimes peeling skin. Um, and it looks something similar to a, a disease process called Kawasaki disease, which has been uh, well known now for several years. 
Um, about uh, two thirds of patients who have developed MISC uh, in the pediatric age group have required hospitalization in an intensive care unit. Um, there's a fair number of patients who will develop um, injuries to other organs. So for example, the kidneys, the lungs with pneumonia, um, but cardiac injury is actually quite common. Um, and this is the majority of patients. They'll either have some degree of cardiac dysfunction, meaning the heart muscle is not contracting as strongly as it should. They may have myocarditis. They may have something called a pericardial effusion, which is a collection of fluid around the heart. We often see um, elevated troponin, as I described before. And um, also we're commonly identifying dilation of the coronary arteries. Those are the blood vessels that come off of the aorta, the big blood vessel coming out of the heart. And those little vessels feed the heart muscle themselves. And um, we have frequently seen dilation of those blood vessels. Now, the good thing is that the vast majority of these cases will respond to therapy. Usually we've been treating with steroids. Uh, and other types of therapies if necessary. And we've seen um, good response to that resolution in the vast majority of cases, um, although it has been reported to have a mortality rate of just under 2%. I'll not go into COVID vaccine right now, but save that for later. And let me just turn to those questions, Jen, and just make sure that I haven't missed anything. I know there were a couple of really specific questions one asked, um, is one more at risk of developing myocarditis again from a different virus? Um, recurrent myocarditis has been described. It's very uncommon in pediatrics. It might be more common in adults. And maybe um, Dr. Heidecker and Dan can elaborate on that during their talks. But um, usually when we see recurrent myocarditis in kids, it's more pericarditis than myocarditis. Um, and it could be that, and, and most times we don't have an organism. We haven't uh, identified uh, a specific type of virus. Um, so it's difficult to say if it's a different virus or, or the same as before. Um, are there guidelines about getting an MRI such as timing or of when it should be ordered? So um, no, there are not formal guidelines uh, established. I think that's a great idea and we probably should be doing that in the pediatric community at least. Um, we are typically doing that at the time of admission. And if, the, if that MRI is abnormal, we will repeat it at six months to see if we have resolution of the injury that was initially documented on that first MRI. Um, so that's becoming a standard and I'm hearing from my colleagues at other institutions that they're doing something very similar. Um, once diagnosed with myocarditis and you're clear to return to exercise, what does it mean if you have continued complaints of chest pain and dizziness? Um, well, this one's a little bit of a challenging question because I don't know exactly the details of this particular situation. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm assuming if they've been cleared to return to exercise, that means their cardiac function has normalized their laboratories have normalized and everything on subsequent testing is reassuring. Um, one thing that I am doing, and I know that not all of my colleagues are doing this, but if I have uh, a child who wants to participate in competitive athletics, for example, school sports, and they've had myocarditis, I'll run them on the treadmill. I'll do an exercise stress test. That may be overkill. Um, I, I know not everyone is doing that but I would certainly do it in a patient who has continued symptoms such as chest pain and dizziness. The guidelines are that um, you shouldn't be released to play competitive sports unless you have return of function. So your heart function has to be normal. Your troponin has to have cleared and be normal. Um, and you can't have abnormal or dangerous heart rhythms um, on subsequent testing. And so those are criteria that need to be met. Um, I'm seeing, you know, as, just as a pediatric cardiologist unrelated to heart failure, you know, I also see other things besides heart failure. And um, I'm seeing a lot of chest pain and a lot of dizziness in the last two years, more than I've ever seen in my career. Um, and I'm having a lot of parents come in and describe to me how their patients are experiencing anxiety and depression. 
and they're concerned that their symptoms may be related to that. Um, I just saw a, a study recently where um, uh, it's been described that um, the incidence of um, eating disorders in children have increased by 25% in the last two years. And so I think anxiety is real. Anxiety shouldn't be dismissed. Uh, anxiety does cause physical symptoms, the perception of symptoms. And so I think that's something that we have to consider in our differential diagnosis if everything else that we're testing for is coming back normal. Um, and then this very difficult question that Jen alluded to, if you are not diagnosed with myocarditis and you die in your sleep, what are the chances that if you were diagnosed correctly and taken to the hospital that you would survive? Well, first of all, I'm very sorry uh, to the family who, who lost their child. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I'm not, I, I'll tell you how I perceive this question as being asked. To me, this sounds like a child passed away in their sleep and then had an autopsy performed that revealed that myocarditis, yet a diagnosis of myocarditis had not been made. That's how I'm interpreting this. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, and there are a lot of unknown variables, uh, I'm afraid to say, in this question that makes it difficult to answer. Um, as I alluded to, sudden death does happen in myocarditis. Now we know that witnessed sudden events um, have much better outcomes than unwitnessed sudden events. And so I don't know if that would have made a difference if the patient had been hospitalized at the time. Um, we have a mortality rate of about four to 5% among hospitalized patients with myocarditis. So I can't say that, uh, no, it would have prevented uh, a sudden event like that, like dying in one sleep. The other question is, did this patient actually have myocarditis? Um, because there are other cardiac causes of sudden death that can happen um, while sleeping, such as abnormal heart rhythms or uh, disease of the muscle called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we have seen uh, occur in sleep. So I'm afraid I can't give a solid answer on that. I wish that I could, um, but that's a challenging one for me. And I, I don't know with certainty that it would have made a difference. Um, but I'm happy to ask, uh, answer any other questions later on in the talk. And uh, thank you, Jen, for uh, the opportunity to speak a little bit about this. Thank you very much, Dr. Price. That was very informative. And I'm sure that everybody uh, agrees with me uh, on the call. Now I would like to offer the floor to Dr. Dang and Dr. Heidecker. I have broken up the areas for discussion as follows. Mm -hmm giant cell myocarditis, viral myocarditis, and then pericarditis and myopericarditis. First, regarding giant cell myocarditis, we know that it is extremely rare, and in the past, most cases were actually diagnosed on autopsy. The questions sent in pertain to, is there any documentation on the number of giant cell survivors in the world that you are aware of? Can it be genetically passed down to children? And are you aware of any new research being done in the field of giant cell myocarditis? Now, Dr. Heidecker and Dr. Dang, you have the floor. All right. Um, yeah, um, maybe about giant cell myocarditis. So on the numbers, uh, I don't have a number for the entire world on survival, but there is data that if giant cell myocarditis is treated early and diagnosed, recognized soon, um, the chance for survival is actually quite high for the first year. It's about 90%, there's some data. So even though it's a very aggressive disease, if you treat it right away. Uh, so that's very different from the past when there was no treatment, right? Where it was about 50%. So this is a big improvement in terms of therapies. And there has been a Swedish study also recently that just described the clinical course of myo um, giant cell myocarditis and compared it to sarcoidosis that was just published this year. And they've shown that, um, as we know, just confirmed again that giant cell myocarditis is much more aggressive. Yeah. But the survival, if treated early and immediately aggressively, is actually good nowadays. I don't know. 
Uh, well, yeah, I agree. There has been uh, um, progress in the uh, immunosuppressive uh, treatment and the related outcomes. Um, first of all, um, the um, uh, first of all, thank you for having us on the panel and um, sending in the questions to everybody on the call. So, um, giant cell myocarditis is obviously um, a very, very rare uh, um, pheno type uh, in form of myocarditis. If you look at myocarditis, as Dr. Price has already pointed out, to let's say um, 100 or so per million inhabitants or 30,000 in the United States, um, it is um, in this cohort um, a, um, probably 1% or so or less uh, 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 entity when Dr. Cooper, Leslie Cooper, uh, the president of the Myocarditis Foundation in 1997 published this New England Journal uh, cohort study of less than 40 patients in the world literature. It was as much as was known and uh, obviously we uh, have to assume that many patients um, with a uh, situation of giant cell myocarditis were not diagnosed because, as um, you have heard, probably often this diagnosis has been made only uh, post-mortem on autopsy. So the second thought is, why is it such an aggressive uh, entity? Um, first of all, uh, to start with how the presentation is of giant cell myocarditis. From a, an adult cardiologist perspective, uh, specializing in heart failure and heart transplantation, it has a very specific course of rapid onset with acute worsening of the clinical uh, status, acute worsening of uh, myocardial function. By the way, it gives me uh, the chance to uh, briefly answer one of the questions that had been asked, ejection fraction, left ventricular ejection fraction, right ventricular ejection fraction. The ejection fraction uh, that here in this case of giant cell myocarditis rapidly worsens is a measure of the function of the left uh, ventricle and the right ventricle the same way. And keep in mind the normal left ventricular or right ventricular ejection fraction is not 100%, it's 55 to 70%. And it is basically describing the amount of blood, let's say if you consider a ventricle full with blood like a glass full of um, uh, fluid, the normal ejection is um, 55 to 70% of that. So there's always uh, 45 to 30% staying in, that's normal. So it's not 100%, but then we classify a reduction of uh, ejection fraction, mildly reduced if it's 40 to 55, moderately reduced if it's 25 to 40, and severely reduced if it's less than 25%. And so with the giant cell myocarditis pre presentation, often within very short periods of time, meaning in hours to days to maximum weeks, it goes from normal to less than 25% to severely reduced. And most and more importantly, even than that, uh, uh, is the uh, onset of very complex and risk uh, uh, carrying ventricular arrhythmias, meaning the, the heart is beating fast and irregular. Uh, it's called ventricular tachycardia and it has a high chance of what we call degenerating into ventricular fibrillation, which is an electrical standstill of the heart. And that presentation is so uh, typical that one needs to uh, think about uh, this as a potential diagnosis very early on. And that leads back to what Dr. Heidegger was uh, saying, the early on thinking about this is a key in uh, improving outcomes. Now, that gives me a chance to <clears throat> answer a second question that was asked and uh, uh, Dr. Price has partially already answered, what kind of diagnostics should one entertain? The general question of which role in the uh, diagnosis of myocarditis uh, is endomyocardial biopsy uh, uh, um, playing is being raised. So we uh, usually have obviously after the history taking and the physical examination and the 
laboratory tests that uh, specifically here need to assess the myocardial or the heart injury with troponin, the heart function with brain natural with peptide B and P, um, but also then the electrocardiogram, which is uh, playing a very large role in early um, uh, seeing the chaotic pattern in the uh, uh, electrical activity in giant semicarditis, then the echocardiogram, the heart ultrasound, that um, then shows very uh, uh, severely and dramatically reduced function. But then the question, uh, uh, endomyocardial biopsy versus magnetic resonance imaging is coming up. The suspected giant cell myocarditis is one of the few situations where we feel strongly uh, towards an endomyocardial biopsy because, and that's important um, uh, to keep in mind, it may impact the clinical decision making and the treatment strategy. That's the major criteria for endomyocardial biopsy, not just to know something a little more in detail where the clinical treatment course is not being affected. But for giant cell myocarditis, when there is confirmation of giant cells in the heart muscle, meaning by microscopic analysis, these are indeed cells that look completely different from other cells, then this confirms the diagnosis. Keep in mind, this is confirmation of a clinical suspicion by the biopsy, and that prompts initially uh, immediate initiation of immunosuppressive therapy. While in other forms of myocarditis, this then would not happen because the benefit has not been as established. So that is why here the endomyocardial biopsy is one of the uh, uh, invasive but meaningful diagnostic tests to rule out or rule in the giant cell myocarditis. One um, question on the mechanism, it is not known. It is potentially related to what is called autoimmunity, meaning uh, the immune system cells attacking own uh, tissue, uh, the person's own tissue. Um, but um, there's a lot um, of research going on, but it is not easy to just determine uh, uh, what causality mechanisms are at work. Um, now comes the uh, question, uh, what if um, there is um, uh, no improvement with giant cell myocarditis? Clearly here we have, um, for example, in the United States, out of 5,000 hospitals, the 100 to 500 hospitals with advanced heart failure programs and the, specifically those 100 to uh, 150 hospitals that offer heart transplantation, an early referral to one of those centers that are actually performing uh, uh, whatever is needed um, is important here in terms of the timeline of not missing anything. And uh, it uh, is indeed, if the heart recovery is not taking place, then an indication for the evaluation for the uh, heart transplantation uh, option. And then after transplantation, we have uh, 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 data that uh, uh, demonstrate that in a in immunosuppression situation after organ transplantation, the viral, uh, the um, giant cells might recur, however, not with the aggressive mode that they pr present um, if there is no organ transplantation and associated immunosuppression. Therefore, it is a wonderful life-saving option if the rare condition giant cell myocarditis doesn't improve enough with immunosuppressive treatment. Thank you, Dr. Dan, for that wonderful information. I'm sure everybody with giant cell uh, or who doesn't have the giant cell on the call um, uh, is uh, more understanding of that disease right now. Um, one question that was posed is genetically, can this disease get passed down to children? I think a caller who has giant cell was concerned about that. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. And the answer is currently there is no hard data that this is a condition that has the same transmission as certain forms of genetically transmitted dilated cardiomyopathy types, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy types, or arrhythmia-related uh, uh, cardiomyopathy types. <clears throat> Second thought on that question is there are um, sometimes impressions, let's say, that in a family there is not only in the person having the giant cell myocarditis who often present, 
by the way, with the history um, of, oh yeah, there was this strange situation where I went to the dentist and I received um, this drug and I responded strangely to that and that's 20 years ago and uh, I haven't even thought about this. Uh, but now uh, maybe there is an association. All of us who have gone through this are smiling on the Zoom call. I can see that already. And uh, it, it, other conditions like, oh, I yes, had the rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, yes, I had this colitis. So, and there may be a, um, a, a, a higher rate in family members, but that would only suggest that there is an autoimmunity component that might play a role. And this is obviously a very careful warning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gang. Um, now I'd like to move on to the viral myocarditis questions. Um, uh, uh, there are at least 25 viral myocarditis survivors on the call today. We have many questions relating to it and I'll briefly scan over them for the audience so that you know what they'll be talking about. Um, recognizing myocarditis and his symptoms, which actually uh, Jack uh, Price has already alluded to. Cardiac biopsy and MRIs, which has also been discussed somewhat. Um, what is the length of time to get better and can myocarditis come back? Um, Dr. Uh, Dang spoke on injection fraction percentage, but there was a question about, can you improve it um, over time? Uh, yeah. Is there anything that one can do to heal from myocarditis and cardiomyopathy, such as um, supplements, uh, things of that nature, and will the scarring, this question has come up repeatedly, will the scarring on your heart ever lessen or go away? Um, people were questioning the usefulness of smart watches for recording heart rate and uh, one lead EKGs, and is one of them, they mentioned Apple Watch, Fitbit, and Withings, uh, is one better than the other, and does the data that you obtain from this information uh, of the watch actually help you to treat the patient. So I put the floor out to you again. Thank you. Yeah, I think in, in terms of recovery, um, I see very good recovery um, since we have new um, heart failure medications, especially. So there are over the last few years, the, a few new heart failure medications were added um, like subcubitril, um, valsartan combinations. Um, I've, I've seen that patients improve the ejection fraction by absolute 10% per month um, if they are treated acutely in their acute myocarditis. So not everyone, of course, but it, the majority improves very quickly if you um, have a patient at an early stage uh, where it's not chronic yet, where there's not a lot of scarring yet. Um, so the chances to normalize the ejection fraction again are very good. Um, from what I've observed um, in terms of what the patients themselves can do. The, the one important thing is to, to abstain from um, moderate to very strong exercise because that can increase the risk for arrhythmias. So we recommend to um, stay away from, from strenuous activity for three months at least. And what we do on our patients is we get an exercise stress test after three months. If everything is fine, if they're not symptomatic, uh, 24 hour EKG and an echocardiogram. And if everything is okay, then we let them exercise again. And then we do a follow-up three months later to make sure that the exercise didn't harm them in any way. Um, in terms of supplements, um, there, I don't know of any strong evidence for specific supplements. In general, fasting can be good for autoimmune diseases in general. And overall, it's a healthy thing to fast. I mean, just intermittent fasting, for example. We're currently doing a study on, on a fasting diet where we want to evaluate if, if um, the autoreactivity of the immune cells goes down with fasting. And there is some evidence that it works with autoimmune diseases. Um, the, the explanation for this is that when the body fasts, um, the, older, the older cells get um, 
eliminated and because it goes on the yeah that's that's just what happens during fasting and in the immune system the older cells are usually the more differentiated cells the more the the ones that have already developed in a specific direction and um that those could be the ones that react against the the body structures so if those get eliminated um that's a good thing and then once the patient starts eating again more new immune cells get produced and those are those have the chance to become more regulatory cells so fasting can be a good way to to get a balance also in autoimmune diseases i have to say stress is a very strong trigger um it's a known factor and i see it in my patients all the time there are patients who are diagnosed with myocarditis or sarcoidosis who had a very stressful year and then suddenly they developed this um, so working on that trying to reduce stress can be extremely helpful also for arrhythmias in general so it's just a very strong factor thinking about what are the really strong stress factors in your life and how can you over or eliminate those or what are ways to cope with stress what what can what's your ventile right to get rid of stress so it's is a painting sports whatever it is traveling i think that's very helpful what what everyone can do um you mentioned the watches um i think um all those monitors of heart rate can be useful um i'm in terms of quality, we did do some research once, which ones are the most accurate. I remember even simple devices like Fitbit did actually pretty well in um, assessing the heart rate. Um, overall, they are good in assessing heart rate and rhythm in general. The Apple watches are more studied because Apple does a lot of research on their own. So they're already very well developed. They do a good job in assessing the rhythm, if it's regular or not, but you cannot um, interpret the ST changes. So you cannot, there's, there's not um, they are not enough accurate right now yet to, to detect a myocardial infarction, for example, a heart attack. And yeah, so I'll let the other ones also join in. Yeah, thank you. you? And I, I want to um, add the following thought and in a way I completely agree with what you just said, Bettina, and um, expand it a little to a um, vision of a concept of care, long-term concept of care that um, will address some of the questions asked in the panel. Also comments um, have been made uh, by Jack and Bettina. And that is starting from uh, the moment where a suspicion is raised. I already talked about the necessity to be very sensitive in noticing a, a giant cell course because it's very malignant. It needs to be thought of as a potential differential diagnosis early on, if not, we have a problem because it within 24 hours can be too late. In another uh, 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 context, and now I come back to the question that was asked to Dr. Price on the, and I'm also sorry for the um, experience of the tragedy in the family that the little one uh, uh, died at night. Um, we have had in the Myocarditis Foundation situations were a, uh, an 11 year old um, in summer camp says to the teacher, I don't really feel that well. And teacher saying, shall we call mother or you wanna wait a little? And then little one says, let's wait another 24 hours. Next day is not better. Mother picks her up on the way to the hospital, she dies. Mm -hmm. So to take very seriously the early communication of what is going on that is a key uh, decision-making branching point. And what it really requires by the clinician is listening. So the listening a modality that is not governed by we have 15 minutes or 900 seconds, and then the relative value units require me to go to the next patient because I need to earn the money and the practice and the hospital needs to do profits. There is a certain attitude that needs to be in the presence of this diffuse presentation from the beginning that goes beyond the way often medicine is practiced. So that uh, comment being made, 
translates into the complex continuum of care. We have often patients between, as you know, um, myocarditis in the adult world, also 20 to 50 years of age. It's not the 152 year olds who present with myocarditis usually. It is a, a devastating experience of having um, chest pain recurring, shortness of breath recurring, palpitation recurring, troponin elevations recurring, and um, the uncertainty that the person experiences by the healthcare professionals saying, on my question, can I go back to full activity? Well, let's wait. And uh, all three of us agree that we usually would say, let's say eight, 12 weeks, do a full um, uh, exercise testing. We at UCLA would do a cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, similar to what Dr. Bryson Heidinger was saying, and then uh, basically mimicking full speed activity and then going back. But still, there are uncertainties in the prediction. How do we deal with those uncertainties? That's a key concept that we need to better understand. We uh, need to embrace the uh, 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 desperation that sometimes come, uh, comes up if a, an undergraduate college athlete who is in the rowing team basically uh, gets to the Myocarditis Foundation, gets to the center, and then basic or football team, we have all these examples and basically gets told, no, you can't participate in this. So the whole idea of how is my life unfolding is affected. We need as a part of a care plan to listen to that life perspective uh, element of how to care. And in that moment, we need to share uncertainty, but doing so also encourage to live with some form of uncertainty emphasizing what uh, was said before. Overall, the likelihood of fatal events is very, very low, but one needs to acknowledge we don't fully know. And that is why it is important to have a relationship that forms over long periods of time and is based on trust. And um, this is, uh, I think, something that needs to be uh, promoted. The Myocarditis Foundation is promoting this, but also from my perspective as a patient, I have my basic human right of being taken seriously and not being kind of uh, thrown out of the office. So that's a challenging uh, situation to observe and we're, uh, from a clinician and patient collaboration via foundation and other initiatives, one needs to actually create the expectation that this is how care should be organized. This is such a conundrum of a syndrome that is often not only acute, it's subacute and it's recurring dash chronic and needs to be looked at in a long-term perspective in order to deal and cope well with that. Uh, do we have any other questions that I would say? Oh, the scarring. Um, the scarring that one may develop on the heart from the myocarditis inflama inflammation. People ask me repeatedly, does that ever go away or will it just lessen? I have explained to it like a really bad cut um, that gets inflamed and then goes down from red to pink and then barely visible, but it usually will always be there. Is that correct? Or um, do you have more information on that, doctors? If I may just uh, uh, jump on that, it's an uh, uh, appropriate metaphor. Often, um, obviously, an acute uh, uh, inflammatory heart muscle episode goes away and you don't see anything in it. But there are situations where it leaves scars and these scars can be seen, for example, on the electrocardiogram, on the echocardiogram, on the magnetic resonance imaging. And indeed, one of the questions asked is how likely is it that a myocarditis transforms into a dilated form of cardiomyopathy? And obviously the answer is, as you expect, not clearly known because we don't know the uh, uh, underlying uh, numbers of myocarditis as a causative initiating triggering event. Uh, and the estimates of that then uh, have an impact on what the percent of dilated cardiomyopathy uh, patients who present later on, talking about one year, 10 year, 20 years later uh, uh, to the um, uh, heart failure uh, team. But uh, clearly uh, these scars translate uh, uh, into functional changes and uh, can potentially uh, persist. 
and uh, therefore uh, lead later on to, as for example, in at very advanced stages, um, uh, often the uh, uh, summary sounds like this is a dilated cardiomyopathy, potentially uh, secondary to a viral myocarditis 30 years ago, but one doesn't really exactly know. Thank you. Thank you very much again for all that information. Um, can we move on now to the pericarditis and the myopericarditis patients on the call? They have questions regarding, is there any connection as to why one person would develop both myocarditis and pericarditis at the same time? And why do some people get repeat episodes of pericarditis? Um, I know Arcalist has not been on the market for a very long time. For those of you who don't know, it's a treatment for repeat pericarditis. And someone has asked if you get onto Arcalist for this chronic pericarditis, will you ever be able to successfully get off of it? And I don't know if that's something you can answer because it really hasn't been around very long, but I give it to you, uh, Dr. Dang and Dr. Heidecker. So myocarditis and pericarditis often occur at once, um, most likely also due to the proximity because the pericardium is right on the myocardium. So if you have inflammation, um, you could expect that it irritates it, each other, the two tissue types or the, yeah, well, the myocardium and the, the muscle and the pericardium. Um, recurrence we see, unfortunately, especially with pericarditis. There are also some gene variants that have been described in myocarditis, which make, which appear to make patients more prone to recurrent myocarditis. There have been some case reports on that, especially, um, for example, desmoplakin variants. That's a gene variant um, that often we, we saw some case reports in children who had recurrent myocarditis um, or young adults triggered by exercise. So um, there can be a genetic predisposition uh, for pericarditis. I don't know of any genetic predispositions. I also don't think there has been much research on that, but it's a phenomenon and a problem. And um, yeah, there are those new treatments and maybe the other ones want to comment on this also. They, they, they are used as a basically um, second line therapy. Usually you're treated with ibuprofen, colchicin. If that doesn't work, steroids, and then you go to interleukin-1 inhibitors. But I let the other ones also jump in. <laughs> I have never used that. I, I'm unfamiliar with it, I have to say, sorry. So, I mean, um, obviously uh, I agree, uh, there's an overlap between uh, myocarditis and pericarditis as adjacent structures for the inflammatory activity uh, can uh, uh, affect uh, both. Obviously there's a classical thinking, the pericarditis, the pericardial sac, which is uh, in a, a healthy situation and invisibly um, small uh, uh, combination of uh, layers on the heart and on the other component that enables the heart to continuously smoothly move. And if a, 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 a triggering event um, uh, affects this uh, sac, the skin around the heart, uh, that is then the pericarditis, uh, which can affect then also the myocardium, the heart muscle, the, than peri myopericarditis, but um, like the infectious agents, like for example, tuberculosis, um, uh, malignancy um, uh, with malignant cells uh, that uh, travel and home in on the pericardial sac and other uh, 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 etiologies. The pericarditis then can become uh, uh, constrictive and constrictive means it, it can build like a, a firm wall that is no longer flexible and smoothly allowing the heart to actually pump and fill with blood, but it becomes a constraining chamber where the amount of total blood is completely defined. And either you eject some blood, then you can fill, or if you don't eject, then you can fill. And it uh, has important implications, not only from the uh, physiological activity, but secondary uh, for example, on the right side of the heart and on the liver function. So 
um, they can concur uh, or overlap, uh, but um, not necessarily. And um, so one, one has to, um, uh, for example, uh, in the diagnostic process, be very sensitive to what is the impact on the uh, heart function, as I just said, if the uh, pericardium is, is involved, not even easy to diagnose. And sometimes uh, involves, um, in this case, uh, uh, more invasive diagnostics, um, uh, heart catheter, sometimes even left and right heart catheter simultaneously to understand uh, what the impact is. And, and that goes diagnostically in concert with imaging that shows sometimes uh, in, in those uh, uh, situations where the uh, pericardium then becomes thickened uh, and actually measurable from uh, immeasurable uh, normal states to up to millimeters or sometimes centimeters. That um, being said, in terms of treatment, as Dr. Heidegger said, anti-inflammatory treatment, this treatment for um, as a archivist uh, uh, inflammatory mediator cascades. In this case, interleukin-1 is one of the um, uh, uh, innate uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, basically in, interleukin-1 in 1983 was described uh, first as the fever uh, uh, initiating uh, uh, what we call cytokine molecule. It's an evolutionarily conserved mechanism that is meant to actually protect the uh, individuum against the invading microorganisms by elevating body temperature and then the cascades of inflammation uh, in order to uh, help uh, the individuum survive. But that um, cascade is now being addressed in this concept, uh, Achilles, uh, by blockade. Now, if a broad uh, blockade is being initiated, it has beneficial effects, but it has also side effects. And the challenge is then to short out the pros and cons. So it's, um, I think, very early, and I have no personal uh, uh, experience with that in, in this uh, uh, entity condition. Wow, thank you all again for that wonderful information. I hope that answered um, the question because I know it has come up before, and I don't think that she's been able to get an answer. And I think that what you just explained is a, a good explanation, at least temporarily, for why she hasn't been able to get that information in the past. Now, for the last part of our talk today, I'd like to ask the total panel to collaborate on the following questions that all our attendees are interested to hear about. In light of our recent COVID pandemic and the fact that the world has heard more about the word myocarditis in the past two years than they have over the past 20 years, there were many questions on myocarditis after COVID or COVID vaccine. Now I'd like to tell the audience to please remember that the, they are learning new things all the time about this disease constantly so that things can change as they learn more about them. And I am sure that they will share as much as they can with you today on what is known today. Now for these questions, doctors, I will ask the question and whomever would like to answer on the panel, please do so. First question um, concerns, are there any lasting concerns that you are aware of if one was to develop myocarditis from the vaccine? Well, uh, fortunately, most people who develop myocarditis from the vaccine have complete resolution of their symptoms um, very quickly, um, usually within 48 hours um, after onset of symptoms. Um, it's very uncommon for patients who have myocarditis after the vaccine to go down a similar pathway as um, traditional myocarditis. Um, so the outcomes are much improved in patients who have this transient form of myocarditis after vaccine than for other types of traditional myocarditis. So a very low numbers of patients who have residual disease. I am following one patient, a pediatric patient, who uh, developed myocarditis after a vaccine, um, who has mildly depressed heart function um, several months after. It's the only case that I have. Um, it's hard to find other cases in the literature. As I said, the overwhelming majority have improvement of their symptoms quickly. Thank you. Um, what are the benefits um, 
versus risks of getting a COVID vaccine if you have already had myocarditis or pericarditis. I think they're probably concerned about developing it again. I would uh, start um, by um, confirming what Dr. Price just said. If look, one looks at the um, associated risks uh, of myocarditis with the vaccine and that in comparison to the natural infection, um, uh, I would say in the adult population, the risk uh, uh, ratio is in the range of one to 100. So while you may have um, uh, side effects uh, from the uh, vaccine, uh, if you had the natural infection, you had a uh, like 10 to 100 times larger chance of having a uh, myocarditis from the natural infection. So in relationship uh, uh, considered uh, the risk to benefit profile, I think um, is, is the, a, a good way to uh, uh, look at vaccinations. And this um, then Dr. Price may comment on this um, is probably not as pronounced in, as the population gets younger and younger. Uh, specifically, uh, if the um, uh, severity of the natural infection in the younger uh, uh, person is maybe not as uh, bad, and uh, therefore the benefit from vaccination may be not that large, but clearly present. So just um, on, on, on that, and uh, just uh, for the day, uh, uh, you know, the news that um, Moderna just in the New England Journal had um, uh, for the 5 to 12-year-old uh, population beneficial results, so it's maybe to comment on that as well. But now the question, if I have had myocarditis, how about vaccination? In general, um, we at UCLA, we would, um, uh, with our infectious disease team experts, I have to say, keep in mind, I'm just a simple cardiologist, but we have our infectious disease experts who would uh, recommend uh, vaccination uh, in uh, general, there are a few exceptions. And interestingly, those persons who have had giant cell myocarditis, where I said earlier, you know, the autoimmunity trigger is not completely known. We have had people who had, um, after um, have, uh, hepatitis and typhoid vaccinations within hours, onset of giant cell uh, myocarditis, very likely linked how, uh, in somehow, and uh, uh, this would be one subpopulation where we would be careful with the uh, vaccination rationale in general. In fact, um, uh, in those rare situations, even writing letters of exemption, uh, if someone is like a junior high school principal and uh, uh, there is a mandatory uh, vaccination, but in general, uh, we would, uh, uh, the infectious disease team would recommend. So that's my um, view on this. Thank you, I think there was, uh a question uh, also about uh, uh, for giant cell, would you recommend the vaccine? What are the outcomes if you were to get the vaccine? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a specific mRNA vaccine that is better for someone with a history of myocarditis or pericarditis? Do you know of? We've just done a very extensive review on, on um, incidence of myocarditis after the mRNA vaccines and the data varies a little bit. Overall, it's about one in a hundred thousand um, in most studies uh, up to yeah between 0 0.9 to 2 in 100,000 varies a little bit. Sometimes you see more in Pfizer, sometimes you see more in Moderna. There was a recent study that showed it's a little bit more common in Moderna because of the, I think there's a higher dosing and more reaction. But at the same time, there are other studies. There was one Danish study where it was actually more common in women with Pfizer, young women, but that was the only one where it was more common in women. So there may be some environmental or genetic factors, I, I suspect. But in all the other studies, it was 70 to 100 percent. It was in men who developed myocarditis. Uh, so I don't see. I also, from my experience with my patients, I don't see that one vaccine dominates to be more commonly uh, the cause for for myocarditis after mRNA vaccine. But maybe the other ones. I think Mario, you wanted to add something also. I I would I would agree with that and. Um... So um, there's no strong data that would suggest um, uh, one over the other in incidents. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, if you're in a high risk age group for developing myocarditis um, and you already have had the vaccine as well as a booster, are there any benefits to getting another booster? Um, well, we discussed this recently. We were we were talking about it with the with the decreasing virulence. We we don't push strongly for getting another boost at the moment, but maybe okay. the other ones will also want to comment. Yeah, I think uh, um, we look at it um, at UCLA in the way um, that was suggested by the original studies when the Pfizer study came out, December thirty one twenty. In the in journal, it was suggesting the 90 to 95 percent um, efficacy after two shots. Within six months, then the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association suggested that after organ transplantation, there was only a 50 percent efficacy likely related to immunosuppression. So therefore, the rationale for booster was strongest in those with immunocompromised systems. And we uh, currently um, uh, uh, advocate uh, for those a second booster. So in contrast to immunocompromised systems, those with a known, and that's the yin and yang of the immune system, an overreactive immune system tending to uh, autoimmunity, that's um, a way to think about this, would clearly not as much as Dr. Heidegger just said, uh, uh, lead in a rationale for a second booster. So. I think it's important to think about it in a, a context of how effective are uh, uh, the early doses and uh, how uh, much booster is needed to have the same efficacy as someone who is not immunocompromised. Yeah, that's a very important point. The immunocompromised, that's, that's a different category, right? So there you would re-booster. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing in children as well. Uh, our pediatric transplant patients, they don't have the same immune response. They don't produce antibodies the same way. Um, they have a lesser response to the vaccine. And so we are recommending booster as well. You know, one interesting thing we've seen with our transplant patients who get COVID, they're not as sick as our pre-transplant heart failure patients who get COVID, which just uh, you know, refocuses the lens on those patients with chronic disease. I, that's another high risk group that um, I would recommend getting a second booster uh, as well. So if you have chronic, you know, pre-existing disease, um, I'm, I'm sure uh, Dr. Heidecker and Dr. Dang are also considering or recommending um, a booster, second boosters in the older age groups. Hmm. You know, my parents, for example, are approaching 80. I, I've encouraged them to get a second booster. Um, so there are definitely groups of people who are at the highest risk and really uh, we should be considering and recommending that second booster. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Thank I, you. Uh, if you've had myocarditis before, what are your risks of developing it again? Say if you were to have like the meningitis vaccine. And we're talking about COVID vaccines, but there was a question about concerns of other vaccines if you develop myocarditis from the COVID vaccine. I am not aware of any data on that. So I have not personally seen that either. Me neither. Yeah, me neither. All right. Um, if I, 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 I just want to add a general thought, uh, Jen, uh, to the uh, question on um, uh, booster. Um, I think we have transitioned uh, 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 um, uh, in the field uh, to thinking of COVID not as a pandemic that has been with us for a time and is then going away, but to think of it as a, uh, uh, an ongoing presence, uh, maybe it's switching from pandemic proportions to endemic proportions uh, with new strains likely continuing to emerge and co-activate, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in seasons of, uh, uh, fall seasons of influenza, uh, anticipating uh, recurrent uh, uh, boosters with uh, potentially uh, more uh, universally applicable um, cross-strain applicable vaccines that have not yet been developed. But to keep it as a, um, a way of living with COVID as opposed to uh, having it uh, had a pandemic, uh, which is now gone. And that implies, obviously, in addition to having the mask and some distancing, some commonsensical behavior available, 
uh, it, uh, I think, requires a mindset that a, a booster or however you want to call them will be with us. You know, the nomenclature is interestingly evolving. For example, the Pfizer one and two uh, 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 called the, the basis, and then the three uh, uh, short called the booster now uh, transitions to the first three called the basis and the fourth called the booster. So uh, expect this to be evolving over time, uh, but uh, with a certain readiness that the vaccines overall uh, are meaningful. And there are few, only very few uh, exceptions like this giant cell situation where there is a rationale not to do it. Keep in mind that immunity is waning. Immunity is not a lifelong immunity. And we have no good data how fast um, antibody titers go down. We have no good data exactly what uh, are the lowest uh, antibody titers that are still effective. We have no real good data how the next Omicron or other variant is going to be affected by the current vaccines that were developed against another strain. So there are uncertainties in this as well. So I think um, the general mindset is uh, vaccines and uh, even breakthrough infections post-vaccination with natural booster of uh, immunity are likely going to continue uh, uh, and stay with us. OK. Um, there was a question about steroids um, on, for pericarditis. Uh, someone must be on steroids. And it is it best to finish the therapy before taking a COVID vaccine? depends a little bit at which stage of immunosuppression you are on, right? So the, the steroids, they will um, decrease your immune response to the vaccine. So if, if that's something you would have to directly discuss with your cardiologist, um, because if it, you have to weigh risks, benefits of the immunosuppression versus how necessarily you need the vaccine at this point. Um, because if you have a very severe myocarditis that's damaging your heart, you still need the immunosuppression. You cannot just stop it. But if you're already tapering it off, it would be good to wait a little bit with the vaccine until it's off one or two weeks and then get the vaccine so that your immune system has an ability to appropriately respond to the vaccine. That's how I do it with my patients. Thank you. Um, can you get a pericarditis flare up uh, after getting a vaccine? Do you know? Have you heard of any? If it was not, if it was another myocarditis before another vaccine myocarditis, or... um, so I guess a... they must they must have had pericarditis before, mm -hmm. and then the they pericarditis. they yeah. were worried about um, getting the COVID yeah. vaccine. Could this cause another? flare of the pericarditis? Yeah, theoretically, yes. Unfortunately, there have been reports of, of various autoimmune diseases that may get triggered after mRNA vaccine. It's very rare. It's usually not so severe, um, but, but there have been reports and I've seen it myself as well. Um, yeah, so rarely it can happen. Thank you. Um, if you've had COVID twice and then you develop myocarditis, are you best with the natural antibodies or should you get the vaccine? I would recommend a vaccine. If you've had COVID twice and you've got myocarditis with it, I would be recommending a vaccine. Okay. Just because if you get the vaccine, the myocarditis that you might get would be a lesser well, in theory, you should have developed antibodies after the first infection. Uh, and so obviously that person was still at risk of developing COVID again, if that's what, okay. if that's what truly happened. Okay. So I would recommend a patient like that getting a vaccination. Okay. And if I may just add, there has been a very large study in Israel, national study, where they compared um, individuals who had vaccine versus individuals who did not have vaccine, but got COVID. And in each group, there were more than 800,000 participants and they compared them with each other. And they found that the risk of getting myocarditis from COVID was six times higher than get the risk of getting myocarditis from the COVID vaccine. So there is a clear benefit. Yeah. That's a definite number. That's a, I wouldn't want to be dealing with that number, that's for sure. 
Okay. Um, how do uh, how long usually do the symptoms of myopericarditis uh, last? Um, just in general, they asked about the shortness of breath, the chest pressure, and the racing heart because I believe that there this person has had ongoing situation with these complaints. I think the um, um, question is a very um, important question and uh, not easily answerable in a generalized way. Because as I said earlier, that's why I made this uh, um, comment about the long term concept of care. From my personal practice, um, we, we have situations where um, people have um, symptoms that are not acutely coming and uh, leaving. But that's why then it's called subacute or a chronic situation uh, staying and uh, fluctuating in a non easily predictable way. So, in a way, um, the answer is um, it's unknown in a, a, a you know uh, in the absence of prediction tools uh, how uh, long a, a symptom status will last. Um, clearly, what's really important is a time course um, characterization. If you see that, um, let's say, um, inflammatory markers and injury markers like troponin, C-reactive protein are coming down over time, you can extrapolate uh, to a situation where um, uh, likely it's going to be no longer uh, present. But often, um, these biomarkers also are fluctuating, and that's where it becomes difficult to predict. Okay, thank you. I, I Right now, I don't have any other questions except for one from the audience. They are asking, can vaccines stimulate the immune systems uh, and cause to, uh, rejection in transplant patients? I think it's an excellent question. And um, um, it's excellent and very timely. Uh, for example, at UCLA, which is you know one of the large heart transplant programs, we had just yesterday in our weekly meeting uh, discussions because um, there are uh, obviously in other virus conditions uh, like cytomegalovirus. Um, uh, data that um, uh, uh, suggests that um, there is um, an activation of a, uh, a, a immunity response that um, is triggered by the uh, surface uh, uh, molecule on uh, viruses that may mimic um, the uh, surface molecule of similar uh, allo uh, uh, antigens. And uh, this could be the case uh, for COVID as well. We just don't have good long-term data on that yet, but uh, in from the discussion that's going on, um, it is possible. And so one needs to be sensitive to time e sequence of events, like someone has uh, either uh, the COVID natural infection or theoretically also vaccination, and then there is some uh, clinical rejection event to actually at least consider that this is not just coincidence, but we don't have any any strong data. And it's clearly also not a reason for a transplant person not to get vaccinated. As Dr. Heidegger says, overall a benefit and risk uh, clearly, as I said also earlier, is towards vaccination, but uh, there may be um, uh, uh, triggering events specifically from natural infection that we have not understood well yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this session, I believe, was very informative. Thank you all for sharing your valuable information with our audience today. Um, oh, what is this, more questions? Oh, I have a specific giant cell question that was just handed to me. Is sarcoidosis easy to distinguish from giant cell myocarditis? Not easy. It's actually an area with still a lot of research. Um, there are some very typical characteristics on histology on the biopsy that distinguish giant cell myocarditis from sarcoidosis. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's difficult to obtain sufficient tissue. It's sarcoidosis. You cannot always 
on first attempt at detecting the heart. So we often do it, we always do a PET CT scan and then we see where the areas of inflammation are. Often there are also lymph nodes that are involved and we have higher sensitivity when we do subsequently also a bronchoscopy to biopsy the, the, the lymph nodes uh, next to the trachea. So it's, it's um, most of the times though you can tell from histology. It's in rare cases you have to get input from several experts to make a definitive diagnosis. Um, another question is giant cell myocarditis associated with other autoimmune disorders and can such association show up after transplant? I think that's a, a very good question. As, as I also said earlier, um, uh, uh, the uh, clinical uh, perception is that it may be associated with other immune conditions. And um, yes, it also uh, may be uh, showing up after transplantation, keeping in mind that the um, immunosuppression uh, after organ transplantation is always trying to uh, be tailored so that the likelihood of rejection but also the likelihood on the yin-yang opposite side of infection is minimized. So never ever is immunosuppression uh, completely massive. Therefore, all the mechanisms that were uh, operative prior to organ transplantation can still break through and uh, appear, uh, uh, but one again cannot predict when and how intensely this could happen. Um, well, we've got more in, more questions coming in. Uh, is there any country or part of the world that you're aware of where giant cell occurs more frequently? Um, what is known, uh, it is so difficult to answer that question because probably much is not known. And um, so our not knowing makes it difficult to answer this. It's very difficult. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, this uh, uh, how do I move from my last one? Okay. okay, I'm going to read the first question again before I give it to you. But is recurrent myocarditis considered a chronic disease? I think yes. If, if it is this uh, phenotype, you know, that it is not, let's say, gone after three months, but uh, continues to flare up. And as I said earlier, this unfortunately can be debilitating uh, 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 for people who are otherwise in excellent overall condition. Uh, it is by definition a chronic uh, uh, disease condition. Okay, uh, there's a question about supplements such as Kratagis. I haven't heard of that before. Is it helpful? Do you know anything about that substance? I've never heard of that. Okay, did that, where did that come from? No, no, from what part of the world? You don't know. Okay, I mean, I just asked Melissa if it came from. Probably, yeah, it, I would answer this question here, Kratigus or Kratigut, uh, you know, it's probably one of those 50,000 over the counters, uh, dash homeopathics, um, that um, haven't been studied in specifically a more Western type of concept. Uh, keep in mind, um, uh, uh, there's only limited uh, uh, numbers of. Uh, interventions studied in these um, uh, classical uh, ways like randomized controlled clinical trials. What I usually uh, is, uh, like to say is two things. Uh, one, um, uh, we don't know uh, about this because it hasn't been studied. So in that moment of not knowing, it is not uh, me as the clinician to say you can or you must not take. It is you as the person who will swallow it to make a, 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 an informed decision. So that's the role distribution. And the, the second thing is consider the interaction between uh, uh, different uh, uh, substances that interact uh, uh, amongst one another. And these interactions, the more you have, they multiply in potential combination effects that we have just not studied at all. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a genetic link to predisposition of myocarditis? What is the gene and can you find it on a detailed DNA report? Yeah, I briefly mentioned that earlier. So there are a few genes that have been described to be to be associated like decimal plaque invariance, and you would see that in genetic testing, you can test it for that specifically. So decimal plaque is what they would be looking Dismal for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we saw that especially in young adults who get repeat elevated troponin levels after exercise. We also published a family that a case about family where the two sons each time when they did a like a soccer game for example a tough one they, they had severe elevation of troponins and myocarditis also the mother was not affected but she had the gene variant also oh, okay and there are other case reports on this more plaquin okay uh, can dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure improve or does it always get worse mm -hmm. Um, I think um, this is a good question that um, we would answer clearly with yes, if appropriate uh, uh, therapies, you know, the stage therapy, including to start with lifestyle changes were not only, let's say, two grams sodium salt restriction, half a gallon fluid restriction, but daily exercise and journal bookkeeping about daily weight, blood pressure and heart rate close communication with your team and uh, 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 physical activity uh, 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 as uh, comfortable, but also then the heart protective medications that Dr. Heidegger already alluded to are being implemented. There is a, a very good likelihood that the heart failure syndrome stabilizes and stays similar, sometimes uh, to a certain extent uh, heart function improved. But there's also obviously um, a chance of progression over uh, various time intervals. And it's not easy, again, to predict which direction this is going. But clearly, there is a potential to have a, an influence in a very positive way uh, on the heart failure condition. OK, um, just a couple more. Is there anything known about long-term colchicine use? <clears throat> Anybody? I don't think so that there are studies on long-term use now. Yeah. Okay. There, uh, there was recently something that came out and I, I just sort of skimmed it very briefly, uh, a relatively small study looking at long-term use of colchicine in patients with heart failure. So not necessarily myocarditis and just, you know, sort of, I guess, prophylaxing or treating a metabolic type syndrome, inflammatory syndrome with better outcomes, but, you know, as far as myocarditis, I, I'm not aware of anything. Okay, and this is the last one that we can do. Um, how variable from one year to the next are readings for LVEF and RVEF? Um, that's left ventricular ejection fraction and right ventricular ejection fraction found from study to study how well do ejection fraction readings compare between echo and cardiac MRI? Good question. Uh, there are various uh, um, components of variability source. Um, number one, it can obviously uh, be the case that a person's heart function changed over uh, a year. So that's obviously then the uh, uh, root cause, so to speak. Number two, um, between uh, two um, uh, examinations by echocardiography, for example, if two uh, different uh, operators uh, do the echocardiogram and two uh, different uh, readers uh, interpret the echocardiogram, even the same heart function can be uh, varying with a, a few percentage points. And number three, between the method of uh, assessing left ventricular ejection fraction, for example, by echocardiogram versus uh, uh, radionuclide imaging versus uh, magnetic resonance imaging, method-related differences also play a role. In other words, it is good not to become too 
let's say, fixated on a specific percentage point and become depressed if it goes down by one percentage point uh, or open a bottle of uh, cranberry juice um, if the percentage uh, point goes one up, you know, it's rather uh, a good idea to see it, uh, number one, with a grain of salt uh, um, in the range. And number two, uh, feel clearly that the readings are embedded in the clinical signs and symptoms and the personal uh, well-being. So it all needs to make sense together. There's nothing magic about percentage points in these readings. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay, I know it's a little before time, but um, I'm going to uh, call the meeting, I believe. Um, we will be posting the recording of this on our website within the next week or so. I want to thank all the doctors again for giving of their time for this very important uh, meeting with our patients. Uh, we realize how important it is and we know the importance of in-person in um, meetings, which have had to take a back burner, so to speak, to the pandemic. Um, but hopefully with this being behind us uh, now and becoming endemic as opposed to pandemic, perhaps we can um, move forward with our inpatient meetings in addition to these Zoom calls for those who can't participate who aren't uh, close enough to us in proximity to attend the in-person meetings. Um, I really, really thank all the participants on the meeting uh, as well. And I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so very, very much. Hey, Jen. Um, hey, yes. just real quickly before we go, I, I thought Barry asked a good question. It's the very last question uh, is Barry's iPad. He says, is the clinical presentation of myocarditis difficult to distinguish from acute MI? Which I think is a great question for the adult, adult cardiologist. Yeah. But I'm curious how they sort through that. Yeah, so this is a, a great question. And um, the answer would be um, when someone comes in with chest pain and electrocardiographic uh, changes that include ST segment elevations and uh, troponin as heart muscle myocardial injury markers. The differential diagnosis obviously includes injury from inflammatory condition, myocarditis, but also injury from uh, a blockage of the coronary artery. That then uh, will prompt very likely a, a rapid workup that may include a left heart catheter coronary angiogram. And uh, in that moment, uh, the uh, presence of patent uh, coronary arteries would give the answer uh, that this is not a, a, a heart attack. Um, it, uh, otherwise, uh, if obviously blockage is present, one would uh, conclude this is a heart attack. And um, if not a heart attack, then it makes um, clearly the diagnosis of uh, inflammatory heart muscle disease much more likely. So in other words, there may be acute presentations where the differential diagnosis that is always then established upfront as possibility um, requires uh, uh, further workup. And obviously the more acute and the more severe, the more aggressive the uh, uh, invasive diagnostic workup will be. In other words, it's important uh, to complete that process and not assume just because someone is young that this is quotation mark just myocarditis or often gen peri myocarditis. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, obviously, if you go into much detail, there are probably well um, established ways of looking at details of echo uh, electrocardiograms over a course of some time that would suggest this is likely inflammatory and not coronary artery. But uh, not always is this with su sufficient, let's call it sensitivity specificity. So I think it's important to be prepared to rule out the dangerous stuff early on. Okay, thank you, Jen, I appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Price. Um, I believe that that's it. Does anybody have anything else on the panel to add? 
The last thing I want to add is, um, and I um, uh, find it curious that no one alluded to this, um, uh, as COVID is becoming endemic, we will more and more have to deal with what is called sequelae of acute COVID or a long COVID. And uh, the long COVID syndrome probably is not a singular syndrome, but is a syndrome that uh, can take the organ uh, manifestations um, uh, of any single organ and uh, not necessarily has to do with acute COVID. So if someone has gone through an acute COVID uh, condition, including uh, myocarditis, uh, we are expecting uh, this also a year afterwards to still be potentially affecting in unpredictable ways uh, uh, the well-being. I just want everyone to just have heard that this is increasingly, let's say, a part of the practices and overlaps somehow with myo and pericarditis presentations. Uh, and we all are very early on in understanding this because long COVID outcomes have been just observed for a year, you know, uh, but um, uh, require a lot of further work to understand. Thank you, Dr. Gang. And I just want to add, uh, since Dr. Gang brought up again about COVID, I meant to mention it earlier. I understand that he has just been awarded a $3 million grant from the NIH, I believe, to study COVID. So he will be knowing a lot more about this in future presentations. But of course, you know, it takes a while to uh, do these studies. So this isn't going to be immediate, but congratulations again, Dr. Dang on the uh, award of the grant uh, to study this disease that has baffled so many of us over the past couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Everybody have a great weekend. And I thank you so very much again for joining us. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Good invitation. Bye bye. Thank you.